I looked around the restaurant nervously. I used to be pretty good at dating, but years of inactivity had caused my wooing and flirting abilities to atrophy. Blind dates like this are especially hard because, let's face it, a blind date is like sticking your hand in a geyser. Most of the time, nothing happens, but if your timing isn't right, you can get really burned. A regular date is bad enough. But at least then you have already met this person and know something about him. You most likely ask them if they would go with you, and they said yes. This usually boosts a guy's confidence because you have a woman who is already interested in you, enough to want to spend time with you. If it doesn't work out, well, that's what dating is for. Sift through to find the one for you. Blind dates, on the other hand, are usually set up by well-meaning friends who set up two people who are probably perfect for each other because no one else wants either of them. The people involved are usually described with terms like she has a great personality or he's a great guy. Once you get beyond your 20s, it gets even worse. People are starting to wonder why you were never married. Of course, the worst thing is when you are already married. If you're divorced, it's like saying that someone wanted you, but once they got the chance to live with you, they found out what was wrong with you and sent you back. Sometimes I think of divorced people as being like those characters from the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer Christmas special. They belong to the island of clumsy toys. I couldn't believe I was so desperate, but here I am. Before I could get further into my mental wanderings, a group of women appeared at the door. They all looked around the restaurant. At first I thought they were all together, but the way each of them looked around told me that wasn't the case. The first one must have weighed 400 pounds. Oh, please don't let it be her, I thought. Phew, the danger has passed. The woman at the other table waved to her. God, please let it be her, I thought, looking at the next one. Unfortunately, a man approached her and took her away. Wow, I'll probably have to sneak out of here. The latter was thin, bony, and about six feet ten inches. It seemed her neck muscles weren't strong enough to support the weight of her glasses, so she kept looking down. Are you looking for me? came a seductive voice from behind. I turned away from Big Ethel and was pleasantly surprised. She was about 5.4 and built like someone's wife. It was created for comfort. She was neither too fat nor too thin. She was perfect. She had a few extra pounds. But what would a normal woman in her mid-thirties be without them? She had shoulder-length rich brown hair that flared out and was longer on one side in the front. Her blue eyes sparkled mischievously. She was still smiling at me. She had generous breasts and round hips, a little roundness in the belly. Her legs had probably been great once, and they were still very good. Overall, I was pleased. She wasn't a supermodel. She was the girl next door who grew up. You're Rudy, aren't you? She said, bringing me back to reality. Uh, Rudy, I said smoothly. She laughed and it was the most beautiful sound in the universe. Suddenly my legs became very interesting to me, and I had to look at them. She gently grabbed my chin. Let me guess, you're a little nervous about meeting me, aren't you? She asked. I nodded. I think it's really sweet. You look good. There's no reason to be nervous. Let's have a great dinner and get to know each other better, okay? With a couple of sentences, she restored my confidence. When dating... What men really need is confidence. Women usually control everything. We ordered. She took some strange thing that she said she loved. I was confused. I really liked this woman and I had to analyze everything I did, even before what I ordered. If I ordered steak, she would probably think I was being too aggressive and expecting us to have sex tonight. On the other hand, I also couldn't order chicken in any form. So I took the safe option and got the grilled salmon. It wasn't red meat, but grill still sounded manly enough. We had a very pleasant conversation during dinner. We laughed a lot and smiled at each other a lot. We seemed to have similar personalities, and I began to wonder why this woman was single. After the meal, she suggested we get some ice cream and go for a walk because she enjoyed our time together and wanted to get to know me better. This is where the real bedlam began. Ice cream, I snorted. 
my usually calm face distorted at the mention of this. You don't like ice cream? She asked tenderly. I think she was afraid I would panic. She may have recognized something in my eyes, but her smile returned. I think there's a story here, don't you? She asked. I pursed my lips and nodded. So let's skip the ice cream and just go for a walk along the boardwalk until you tell me about it? I paid the bill and we walked out the door. We went to the embankment near the entrance to the restaurant. It was a cool evening, so I gave her my jacket. The moon was high in the sky and illuminated the night and the river beautifully. I really liked this woman and wanted to get to know her better. In my imagination, I saw us together, so she had to find out sooner or later. I've been married before, I began. I'm a widower. Me too, she said quickly. More than once, three times actually. Well, it must be something like this with you, I said. You're so sweet. I couldn't imagine anyone ever wanting to leave you, so I didn't think you were divorced. Are you really so cute, she said, grabbing my hand and hugging me. The position we were in had my hand resting on the side of her generous breasts, and yes, that made me aroused. Come on, tell me your story, she said. I had been married about eight years when I realized this, I said. I was on a business trip and was halfway to our house when I noticed the ice cream in front of it. My wife Justine was last in line with two or three children. She was wearing only a t-shirt and tight shorts, which made me realize that she was probably working in the garden. When the last of the kids paid for their ice cream and left, I noticed Justine sitting down in the ice cream and it pulled away. I was shocked. I couldn't think of any reason for her to get into the ice cream. I went home and unpacked my things while I waited for her to return. When she came in, she looked at me nervously and I could tell she had done something wrong. She came over and tried to kiss me, but I pulled away. I still haven't decided what to do. The first thing that came to my mind was to file for divorce right away in the morning. I gave it up because, ah, I didn't have any concrete evidence. And B, in our state, she would get half of everything. I really didn't like the idea of paying this bastard to keep cheating on me. I think deep down, I loved her, and didn't want to just throw away our happy life. But I think even then I knew that my life with Justine was over. Justine was a beautiful girl. I say girl because even in our thirties she was built like a high school girl. She didn't have pom-poms, but she had everything else. Strong muscular legs, round little butt. God, how I loved her. What's wrong, dear? She asked. I think I have a cold, I said. I'm going to take a shower, she smiled. I'll cook dinner, and then we can spend time together. The way she said it, I could tell she wanted to try and give me guilt sex. I hardly ate. In fact, I was just pushing food around the plate. Well, if you're not in the mood to eat, maybe we should take a nap, she said. Actually, I'm not in the mood to sleep either, I said. Me too, she said, smiling at me. Justin, I've been on the road for a while, I said. I need to take care of some things. But, she began. Maybe later, I told her. I headed to the garage. When I really need to think, I wash my car. My car, that is, my 2009 45th anniversary Mustang GT, not the Ford Fusion. I drove for business trips and work. I didn't go into the house until Justine fell asleep. The next morning I got up early and left the house. I was too sad to go to work, so I called my boss. I told him that I had caught some kind of infection and needed a couple of days to get better. He was so pleased with the sales I made during my business trip that he told me to take as much time as I needed. I parked the car around the corner from us and snuck into the house across the street. I was thinking about this last night. Our neighbors moved away for a month and left their keys with us so we could water their plants and pick up their mail. I decided to see how often my wife has sex with ice cream. I thought this might help me decide what to do next. How surprised I was. I was watching my neighbor's TV and enjoying myself when I heard a loud roar coming down the street. Damn, I thought. I forgot to take out the trash. I looked out the window and saw Justin wheeling a heavy trash can to the curb. Then I saw the garbage man get out of the car and go to help her. He dumped the can into the garbage truck and she rolled it back to the side of our house. He followed her into the house. 
I ran to the side of the house to see what was happening. They came into my living room. Justine pushed him onto my couch in his dirty work pants. Then she undressed him. From my corner in the house across the street, I couldn't answer all. The questions swirling around in your dirty little heed right now. I couldn't tell if he was bigger than me or what shape or size his assets were. But really all I could say was that my marriage was over. Justine started having sex with him. This went on for a few minutes, then she got up and started talking to him. He didn't seem very pleased. She then walked him to the door and pushed him out. I looked through the front windows again and saw him kicking my door before getting back into his truck and driving away down the street. He knocked over a couple of trash cans and missed several completely. As angry as I was at Justine, the sight of a rampaging garbage truck tearing through the neighborhood was funny as hell. But my laughter was interrupted when my cell phone rang. I answered the call and was shocked. Rudy, why didn't you sleep in our bed last night? Asked Justine. I told you I have a cold, I replied sharply. Well, why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you come and kiss me goodbye before you left this morning? You've already been gone for two days. Is something wrong? She asked. I was silent. Rudy, I love you. I always have, she said. To the grave. I have to go, I said. I have a call on the other line. Throughout the day, until it was time to return home, I watched her. When an ice cream maker passed by, she didn't go towards it. Maybe she suspected I knew something, or maybe it was too close to the time I was supposed to be home, and she didn't want to take the risk. As she started cooking dinner, I ran around the block, picked up my car, and drove home. I'm not sure if it was because the novelty of the situation had worn off or what, but the discovery that the ice cream man wasn't the only man besides me who slept with Justine didn't surprise me. What really surprised me was that she tried to kiss me when I walked in the door. Why don't we have a quick dinner and then go for a ride? She asked. Going for a drive was Justine's code for drive somewhere and park like teenagers. I have to admit, we did this a lot. We'd drive to a secluded location and start with a few gentle kisses, which often progressed into full-on hard sex in front of anyone who passed by. I always knew Justine had a slightly kinky side, but it still turned me on. I'm not feeling my best tonight, I said. Besides, we've done this hundreds of times. I started my own code now. It meant, You'll never get your dirty ass in my Mustang again, and I won't have sex with you. But you always said that you would never get tired of... She began. She really looked offended. I couldn't understand her. It was like something out of goddamn Twilight Lane. She cheats on me with... I don't know how many guys, but acts like she's offended because I don't fall at her feet to make love to her. How much sex does she need? Does she have a quota? Does she need to have sex with a certain number of guys a week to live? Justin, just give me a few days to get over this cold I got, I said. I feel a lot nauseous. I'm also a little irritable, so sometimes I don't say what I mean. She nodded her head. Would you like me to make you a cup of tea and just lie next to you and hold you like that time you had the flu last year? She asked. It was so nice. Well, I know it wasn't very nice for you with the fever and vomiting and headache, but for me it was wonderful. I was just laying there, taking care of the man I love, providing for him. Everything you need. The only thing that could be more romantic is if you asked me to stop taking the pills and have a baby for you. Of course, I didn't say anything. But I'm sure you can imagine what was going through my head. How would we even know whose child it is? Please stay on the pills. I don't need any more complications in my divorce. I grunted to admit that I heard her because she looked at me as if I had to say something. What should I have said? Justin, I'm really worried about you getting it from me, I said. Maybe I should just order some pizza and move to the guest room. No, she said sharply. I love you, Rudy. Whatever you're going through, I'll risk it. I don't want to spend another night without your arms around me. Then suddenly, she extended her hand and placed it on my forehead. You don't have a fever, she said. We decided to find a compromise. She will remain on her side of the bed in deference to my concerns for her health, but I will sleep in our bed so she can be next to me. With that settled, 
she went into the kitchen to finish preparing dinner after telling me that if I was sick, I needed good nutritious food, not pizza. Maybe now my confusion is understandable. I just couldn't figure this woman out. Not that any man could ever fully figure out any woman, but this was the woman I loved until yesterday. On the one hand, she cheated on me with at least two other men. On the other hand, she claimed to love me deeply and seemed genuinely concerned about my well-being. Both situations seemed true. But how could this be? If she loves me so much, how could she treat me so disrespectfully? It didn't make sense. After dinner, she went to the bathroom and came out in an outfit that was reminiscent of when we were younger. She squeezed herself into an old skirt and cheerleader top and nothing else. She stood right in front of the TV I was trying to watch and started reaching out. She then turned her back to me and bent down in front of me. Then she did some very high jumps. Every time she jumped, I saw that she wasn't wearing panties. Just lie down, she said. I'll do all the work. It's been three days, Rudy. The thought of having sex with her the day before my trip filled me with horror. My stomach became very uneasy. I can just please you, she said tenderly. And if you want, you can have me. What followed was not pretty. We had just finished dinner, which only gave me more ammunition. If there was a category in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most powerful fountain of vomit, my photo would be next to it. Undigested vegetables from the soup we ate were everywhere. Her skirt was probably ruined, and I'm sure at least a couple of carrot pieces got into it. You're really sick, aren't you? She asked. My poor baby. I think I should really move into the guest room, I said. Again, before I could even explain why, she interrupted me. No, Rudy, not a chance, she said. I love you. You're stuck with me. The part of me that still loved her came out then. Somehow, after I watched her have sex with two men in less than 24 hours, she was still trying to find reasons why her behavior wasn't so bad. Maybe that was the point, I thought. Perhaps it was because I was away from home for two days and didn't have sex the night before. If that was the case, then it must have been hard for me because I remained faithful to her, but she seemed so desperate to prove her love to me. Later that night, when I got into bed next to her, she rolled over to me and mumbled that she loved me. This made me cry. She was asleep and still claimed she loved me. This could not be fabricated. What's happened? The next day, after I parked my car around the corner again and got to my neighbor's house, I started watching her again. This time I took binoculars with me. As I watched her cook the meat and pack for the evening's dinner, despite my feelings, I smiled. She cut the steak into small pieces. She also had peppers, beans, and mushrooms. There was no doubt that she was preparing my favorite dish. She went out onto the terrace to sunbathe. I heard her humming to herself as she flipped through the magazine. She looked very good in her swimsuit. Even after all this time, she could still turn me on. God, how I will miss her. Then she looked at the house from which I had been watching her. I thought for a moment that she knew I was there. But she just smiled and started talking to herself. Maybe she was just bored and lonely. I think we all talk to ourselves sometimes. But she wasn't just talking to herself. She was talking to me. Luckily, the window overlooking our deck was open a few inches, and I could hear her as well as see through our privacy fence. She probably thought that with no neighbors around, no one could see or hear her. Okay, Rudy, how do you like it? She asked, lowering the straps of her top and exposing her small breasts. I was excited. She began to caress herself. I couldn't help myself. I began to be self-satisfied. It felt kind of dirty to do this while you were watching your own wife caressing herself, imagining that it was you. I felt like an idiot for peeking at her. She dozed off in the sun, clearly tired. Justin, don't fall asleep in the sun, you'll get burned. But not being a clairvoyant, she did not receive my thoughts. I looked at her body. She still had the body of an athlete, slim, tapering hips with sculpted calves that were slightly larger than truly proportionate. Narrow hips, but a full, bulbous butt, like two hemispheres that made seeing her in a skirt almost a religious experience. Her tummy was still flat, even though we were both in our thirties. This was the body I loved. It was mine, damn it. I said vows and went through courtship and rituals to earn him. 
I took care of this body throughout our marriage. I fed him, dressed him, bathed him, lotioned him, massaged him. How dare she give some asshole my body? Then and there, I decided to try to save our marriage. Maybe I could forgive her for having sex with these two guys. Justine obviously loved me as much as she said she would. A little later, she went into the house to start cooking the meat. Then I heard chains rattling and brakes squealing. An NPS truck pulled up to our house. Justine quickly got up and went into the house. She threw on a T-shirt and shorts as she walked past the bedroom and walked to the door. She answered the door and spoke with the driver for a few minutes. He then returned to his truck and she followed him. She got into the truck with him. I thought it was against the rules. They stayed in the truck for quite a long time. When she stepped out of the truck, pulling up her shorts, I changed my mind. There was no way I could stay married to her. As much as I loved her, it was all over. Over the next few days, I made a decision. I took a couple of weeks off to sort out my home situation. I think my boss got a little idea of what was going on when I asked him about getting her name off my insurance and health insurance. He told me to take as much time as I needed, and if necessary, to let him know if I needed to change my situation. I consulted several lawyers, but none of them had good news for me. We lived in a community property state. The best I could hope for was to leave the marriage with my self-respect intact. And after I saw her sleep with other guys, I really didn't have it anymore. It all came down to common ownership. The best I could really hope for was a 50-50 split of our assets regardless of who did what. Basically, guys, your wife can sleep with the football team in front of you, and she'll still get half your stuff. If you have children, you will receive even less. If she has a job and makes less than you, you should pay her. If she doesn't have a job, you have to pay her even more. If she has a job and makes more than you, you get nothing. Obviously, the law was not on my side. I wished that all those times when a beautiful woman approached me during my business trips and I said, No, I'm married, could be replayed. I'd have a baby in every state in the fig union. By the end of the next week, I was ready to go back to work. I had an almost exact schedule for Justine. On Monday, she had sex with the ice cream man. On Tuesday, with the garbage man. The mailman came on Wednesday, and the NPS driver came on Thursday. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday were supposedly all mine. Every weekend since we were married, unless I had to travel for work, we were inseparable. We've always been like this. I thought about my options. I had three. I could pretend I didn't know what was going on and hope it was just a phase she was going through. I hoped that her love for me would eventually prevail and she would stop. Of course, there was nothing stopping her from starting again. The next option was to confront her and tell her to stop. I would tell her straight up that if she doesn't stop, we'll break up. We would, of course, have to go to consultations, which would cost me money. I loved the idea of paying money because she couldn't keep her legs together. The third option, of course, was divorce. Just take and survive this blow, hoping for a favorable judge who will not force me to pay her for too long. I also hoped that she would find someone else and marry him. This option would be better than if she simply moved in with someone else. In this case, I would pay him to sleep with her. And make no mistake, life is not sweet for divorced guys. I'd be stuck in some crappy economy apartment, barely making ends meet. Hell, insurance on my Mustang would probably bankrupt me. God, my future's so bright I need sunglasses. Maybe I could get a part-time job working at some suicide prevention hotline. By the time I returned to work, I was a ball of nerves. It seemed like trouble was coming at me from all sides. At home, Justine clung to me. She was as excited as a cat in heat. Sometimes she would even take my hand and put it down her shorts just to show me how much she said she wanted me. Of course, I was used to washing my hands with one of those industrial cleaners as soon as it touched me. You know, the ones so strong they rip your skin off like acid. There was also a time when she came over while I was polishing my car. I had just spent an hour washing it and was almost ready. She was wearing a short skirt, and she lifted one leg and placed it on the hood. In our younger days, I would have had sex with her right there in the driveway. While we were having dinner that night, she looked me in the eyes, saying it was time. I realized that this is so. 
Do you understand what I'm talking about? She whispered tenderly, smiling at me. Yeah, I said, smiling back. In my head, I thought it was time to get rid of your cheating ass once and for all. Before she stained my Mustang, I was content to just play the waiting game, because no matter how bad I felt, there's nothing worse than having a beautiful woman hanging on your every word and seemingly worshipping the ground on which you walk. If I could just get over the fact that she sleeps with four other guys all the time, life would be heaven, wouldn't it? It's time for us to have a baby, she said. I don't care about what we said about waiting until we were a certain age. I don't care about all the trips we wanted to take or how much money we needed. I don't need a big house. You have everything I need, and you'll be everything our baby needs. You're getting better. I think that cold is finally letting you go after almost three weeks. You're almost back to your strength, baby, so it's time for you to get me pregnant. Women just know how to ruin everything you plan. We always wanted a house full of children. She came and knelt in front of me. She kissed my hand as if she was going to propose to me. Do you swear to have sex with me to pieces? She asked me seriously. Do you know that you are the only one who has ever been here? She said, caressing herself. It took a heroic effort. But I managed to remain calm. I even managed to maintain my calm appearance. This bitch was a sociopath. She was as good a liar as some salespeople I knew. The type of person who can assure you that the special fuel additive they sell you will increase your car's power, clean your fuel injectors, and seal your cylinder head leaks all at the same time. Deep down, they know it's just gasoline. But they charge you 50 bucks for two ounces. Just put it in the tank, they say. Justine didn't know that I knew about the other four guys she cheated on me with on a regular basis. Perhaps she was telling us all the same thing. This way she could increase her chances of getting pregnant. Damn it, how will we ever know who the lucky guy really was who won her? Two is a company, six is a crowd. I had to get rid of Justine somehow. And looking at her while she stood in front of me, smiling, I realized that I hated this bitch with every fiber of my being. She took the love I gave her all these years and turned it into something ugly. Something exploded in my chest, but this time it wasn't bile or vomit. This time it was hatred, and it burned. In fact, the fire burned so brightly that when she looked at me, I felt warm throughout my body. Yes, I knew what Justin wanted. She wanted a damn baby. Well, I also knew what I wanted. After three weeks of being in my head, I finally knew what I wanted. I wanted revenge. I wanted revenge not only against my supposedly loving wife, but against all her lovers. Every one of those bastards needed to feel my hand. Yes, I know what all you smart, sensitive, enlightened guys are thinking. Oh my God, he's going to become a Neanderthal. How pathetic is it that he has to resort to violence? Some of you think these guys weren't the ones who betrayed me. They're just looking for a piece of ass, just like you would. If I need revenge, it must be my cheating wife. Each of these guys knew we were married, but they still had her. It's hard to miss that huge diamond on her finger. They deserved what would happen to them. I needed to make each one individually. It had to be personal. There was also the fact that having a barbecue and inviting all of them and her mom and then showing a video of her having sex with them even though it sounds great in these stories on the internet, was not an option. There were several reasons why I couldn't do this. First of all, they didn't know me from Adam, and they would probably be very wary if I suddenly invited them to a party. Secondly, the bastard in me wanted more than just humiliation or shame. I made my list and started doing my research. Some of these guys would be easy, others would be difficult, and I couldn't forget about the love of my life, could I? I hired a private investigator to get some information about them. I decided to start with the NPS driver because it was one of the hardest. I was wrong. For two hours and two hundred dollars, my private detective called back with a file on him. His name was Riley Smithson, and he was 28 years old. He was married to his high school sweetheart, Darla. They had a two-year-old Yaya daughter, and he took evening management courses in hopes of one day moving into a management position in NPS. I also found out which NPS center he worked at. I decided to start with this. 
I went to the center where Riley worked. I went to the counter where you drop off packages you want to return or pick up packages you missed three times. A very cheerful woman of about 25 sat behind the counter. When she looked to see if there were any packages for me or my address, I spotted someone I could really use. In the place where the trucks were preparing to leave, I noticed her. She was probably about five feet tall, about 200 pounds, and had the loudest mouth on the loading dock. She didn't have anything good to say about any of the guys working there. The woman behind the counter came back and said she couldn't find any packages for me. When she saw where I was looking, she shook her head. This is Nancy, she said. She's a bitch. Everyone here thinks that she only acts this way because she needs a good core. Well, you know what I mean. I really did it. But I wouldn't give it to her if I could help it. But who knows how far I'm willing to go in the name of revenge. I'm going across the street to get my damn coffee, Nancy screamed. When I get back, all this shit better be taken care of. She continued ranting for at least another five minutes. I quickly left and went across the street to Starbucks. There were only three or four free tables, so I took the central one. A few minutes later, Nancy came in. She waved to the waitress and was a regular, so there was a large steaming cup of coffee in front of her before I was served. I pretended to look at her out of the corner of my eye, but did it in a way that, although it was very obvious, seemed like I was trying not to get caught. I also got up and walked past her several times. Every time I did this, I made sure to look at her huge rack and then look away. After my second trip to the magazine rack, she looked at me with her mouth open. Finally, she just took her cup and came and sat down at my table. What the hell is your problem? She snapped. I looked at her as if someone had just killed my puppy in front of me. The expression on my face was one of unimaginable pain and anguish. Some of this was real. I told her how bad I felt when I discovered Justine having sex with me. The expression of anger on her face lessened Ned slightly. She looked at me with interest. Oh, you'll never understand, I said sadly. How can someone like you related to what I'm going through? What are you talking about, she asked. She spread her arms and now leaned forward and I could see her breasts in all their glory. They were fucking amazing. If you took them off her body and put them on someone else, I would love that person. You've made me lose track of what I'm here for, I said. As soon as I saw you, I needed to get a better look at you, so I came over here. I'm sorry, but God, you... I what? she asked. Are you saying that you were following me? I could tell she was intrigued. She leaned further forward. Her plunging cleavage was now fully visible. If she moved any more, her shirt would fall open and her breasts would be exposed. My marriage is over, I told her. The last straw was when I found out she was sleeping with another man. But I have no proof. If only I could catch them off guard like they do on TV, I could get a divorce and be free to find someone new. How are you? Her eyes have become bigger than those huge donuts they try to sell you along with your coffee. Who is this bastard? She asked. One of your truck drivers, I said slowly. But don't worry about it. I'll figure something out. Today and meeting you is the best thing that's happened to me since I found out. I'm sorry. I'm sure you're married or busy. But don't be surprised if you see me from time to time just to look at you. I'm Nancy, she said. And she smiled. That smile changed everything. Her face transformed from the poor evil I had seen at the NPS center to that of a rather attractive woman. Rudy, I said, smiling back. Why don't you walk me back across the street? She said. I could tell she was torn between wanting to go back to work and wanting to stay with me. We got up and left Starbucks. As we crossed the street, I grabbed her hand as if I wanted to make sure she was safe. She looked at me, smiling so hard it felt like her face was split in half. As we approached the building where she was about to enter, she slowed down. She walked so slowly that it seemed like it would take us hours to reach the door through which she was supposed to enter. She was clearly stalling for time. I pulled her to a secluded corner and hugged her tightly. Her eyes grew even larger, but she did not resist. I grabbed her waist, pulling her even closer to me, and I heard her moan. Our position made her huge, soft breasts press against my chest and stomach, but she didn't care. I lowered my hands until they were just above her big butt and then stopped. 
Her head was already thrown back, and her eyes were closed. The first thing you need to know is that I'm a guy. I'm completely healthy and haven't had sex since I found out Justin was cheating on me. At least not with anyone other than himself. When I said no, that really wasn't what she wanted to hear. I truly believe that Nancy would be willing to take her pants off and have sex with me right there in the daylight if this continued. Her eyes widened, as if the loss of contact between us was painful. A, she said. Then her gaze focused on the drop of saliva under my right eye. She thought it was a tear, just as I had planned. No, I said, even sadder and slower. Why? She moaned, as if I had just told her that, although she held the winning lottery ticket, she couldn't claim the prize. Because no matter what Justine has done, I'm not cheating, I said. I want you so bad, but it will have to wait, at least until I get divorced. How could my next woman trust me if I cheated on my last one? She carefully weighed my words, and, as is usually the case with people, she heard only what she wanted to hear. All she heard was next woman and ex-wife. These two phrases in her head already meant our marriage. She grabbed my hands and pulled them back to her curvaceous waist, holding them there. I don't want to let you go, she said, taking a step forward so that her chest was pressed against me again. But I have to admit, I like that you take your promises seriously. So while I really wish we could call in sick right now and not go to work, I respect your wishes, but don't delay. She took a piece of paper from her pocket. She tore off a corner of it and traced it with her finger. This is my work number. I have a break at three o'clock in the afternoon. Call me then and I will give you my house and mobile numbers, she said. Then she left, leaving me in place. I swear when she left, her ass was swaying much more than before. And I, as I said, am a healthy guy. I was hoping I wouldn't have to spend time alone with her. Yes, she's a big girl, but once you get past her sinister facade, she quickly melts away. I was sure that if we ended up together again like this, I would take her. Although I really wanted to remain faithful to my cheating wife until we filed for divorce, the rest of my plan should have been easy. When I got back to my Mustang, I called Riley's house. I spoke to Darla and told her that I work for NPS and Riley would be the first in our month-long driver awards program. He will receive a certificate, a day off with pay, and a two-night stay at his choice of hotels. I wasn't sure when he would receive the award next week because we wanted to surprise drivers somewhere along their route. She assured me that she would be ready any time I called and that she would keep the secret until then. I needed to hurry up with my plans if I wanted to get everything done next week. Riley was fine. My private investigator arranged for me to meet several local gang members. Once we stopped posing and agreed on a price for what I needed, everything went very smoothly. Over the next two days, I watched Justine and she still stuck to her schedule. I noticed that her connections were very short, never lasting longer than ten minutes and sometimes even less. I met with a pimp who put me in touch with an electrician. For the fee I paid him, he offered to include a free service with one of his girls. I deviated, although I was tempted. I met my former gardener's brother. He was the black sheep of a hard-working family. He wanted to leave the city to start his life again. He wanted to completely get out of the illegal business he was in, but he still had gambling debts. It wasn't much, only $1,200, but when you don't have a job, it could be a million. I told him that I would give him the money as soon as he did what I needed. He was very happy. He didn't have to kill anyone. Exactly. And it would take five minutes or less, and he could leave town right away. So I had plans for everyone except the ice cream man, and I was going to handle him personally. So that Thursday, I told Justine that I had to leave town again. It will only be for three days, and then I probably won't be leaving for a long time again. How long will you stay this time? She asked. I couldn't believe it. She was both angry and sad that I was leaving. What's wrong, Justin? I asked. I don't want you to leave, she said in the voice of a little girl. You have been sick and weak since you returned from your last trip. I haven't had sex since you left that time. Rudy, I want to have a child with you. I know I should be okay with this because you always do this, but I just don't want you to leave me. Oh my God, she was actually crying 
because I was leaving town for two damn days. I couldn't stand it. I hugged her, and she started moaning from such little contact. When I pushed her away, I could see the anger in her eyes. When you get back, if you're not ready for sex, we'll go to the doctor, she snapped. Okay, most of you know there was no business trip, but I really wanted to leave the city. Right before we left, I removed the fuse that controlled our air conditioning system. I knew Justin wouldn't be able to stand the heat in the house for long. Less than half an hour after I left, she called me on my cell phone. I told her to look in the top drawer of my desk, and there she would find a business card from a man who was both an electrician and an air conditioning technician. Two hours later, I received a call from a number I didn't recognize. I answered warily. Hi, Rudy, this is Mario. It was the weirdest sex I've ever had, he said. Have you slept with her yet? I asked. My heart sank. Not only did Justine sleep with someone she'd only known for an hour, but she had sex with Mario in our house. She said she might call me tomorrow too, but it would be the last time, he said. I'm sure she got what you wanted, but it wouldn't hurt to give her another dose just to be sure. Whatever, I said. I'm telling you, that bitch didn't even give me a mem- He started before I cut him off. I have to go, I said sharply. As much as I hated Justine at that moment, hearing the details of what she allowed him to do and not do would not have improved my self-esteem, but it fueled that fire of revenge that still burned in my soul. I spent Saturday at the Michigan Auto Show. It was called Mustang Memories. There were over 800 Mustangs from all eras of this car model's history. I got a lot of ideas to customize my car. I decided to wait until my marriage ended before I started working on it. However, the most surprising thing I saw at the show wasn't actually a car. It was a woman. Why not? After all, I'm a healthy man, so I'm going to watch, right? Either way, she must have been the most beautiful woman in the world. She had long waves of red hair and drove an orange Mustang with green trim. Every time I saw her, I couldn't look away. In general, after several hours of being tired of this red-haired beauty, I decided to go home. I was sure that Mario had already fucked Justine again, so there was no point in me staying away from home any longer. The first stage of my plan was completed. I took revenge on Justin, now the rest. I returned home early. I pulled up to the house and the deep hum of my Mustang's Magnaflow muffler announced my presence. I entered the house and collapsed on the sofa. Justine came in and sat on my lap. She told me how much she missed me and how much she loved me. I continued to look around the room. What are you looking for? She asked. I don't know, I said. I was just thinking about all these movies and stories where the husband leaves town and while he's gone. Justine threw her head back and laughed. I would never do that, she said. There is no treason here. Then she took my hand and placed it on herself. This belongs to you, she said. I swear to you on my father's grave that no man has been with me since we got married. Since the day we met, in fact. I looked into her eyes and could not detect any signs of deception or lies. It made me feel really bad about what I did to her. I'm not a saint, she continued. There were a couple of cases when I was touched in places that are prohibited. But that's all. Not even a kiss. You are the only man I love and will love all my life. What about this touching thing? I asked. Don't worry about it, she laughed. Oh my God, you're jealous. Do you still love me? I have to admit, I was a little worried since we haven't done this for weeks. I decided right then and there, if she could lie, so could I. She lifted her shirt and rubbed her braless breasts. Oh, someone still wants me, doesn't they? She asked. Oh, shit, I screamed, my face showing anguish. I fell to the floor and started holding myself between my legs, rolling back and forth. I hoped I wasn't overacting. What's wrong with you, Rudy? She screamed. Then again, if I weren't so sure that she was some kind of champion of pathological lying, I would have believed her concern. She really seemed worried. Justin, I looked into her eyes. I haven't been honest with you the last few weeks, I said. She looked at me seriously. 
You slept with some bitch while you were on a business trip and contracted the disease, she said sharply. I found this quite funny. This was probably her worst fear. Cheaters always think that everyone else is cheating too. Of course not, I snapped back. I would never cheat on you no matter what. She looked relieved. Then what is it? She asked. You know how you always talk about how low my Mustang sits and how hard it is for you to get in and out of it without showing your panties? I asked. She nodded. Well, the last time I left town, I awkwardly got out of the car and hurt myself. It's a common sports injury, but it's embarrassing and painful. I knew I should have told you, but until today, it was almost healed. Another week or two, and I'll be good as new, I said. Oh my God, she said. Please don't tell me you have sprains. I nodded and she started laughing. See, that's why I didn't say anything, I said. Honey, I'm not laughing at you, she said. I laugh with relief. I thought you didn't like me anymore. I honestly thought you didn't want to have children with me anymore. The rest of the day went well. We hugged a lot. It didn't bother me because I knew I wouldn't get infected from it. I even gave her a few gentle kisses without tongue. I told her that deep kisses would make me horny. Every article I read said it was impossible to get infected from kissing, but I couldn't risk it. On Monday, I called her from work and told her I would be an hour late. I decided that I would give her one last try with the ice cream man. In exactly one week, my marriage will end. Tomorrow, the revenge will begin. I will start taking her toys away from her one at a time. On Tuesday morning, I got up at the usual time. For some reason, everything seemed different. The colors seemed brighter. The sounds were more intense. The smells were even stronger. It was as if I had all my senses back after they had been dulled by tragedy or accident. I literally ran out to my Mustang. Justine walked to the door to say goodbye with a kiss. Are you in a Mustang today? She asked. I just smiled and nodded. After I left home, I called Nancy on her cell phone. I've called her twice a day since we met. We had reached the stage where our conversations would have gotten me into trouble if I had been a politician, but we had not seen each other since that first day. I assured her it was because if we saw each other, I was afraid of what might happen. Good morning, beautiful, I said. Good morning, dear, she replied. I was just thinking about you. Were those good thoughts? I asked. No, not at all, she chuckled. I dreamed that some nasty man had sex with me. She sighed loudly, and I realized that she was self-satisfied as we talked. The squeal of brakes brought me back to reality. Nancy turned me on so much that I ran a red light and almost got hit by a car. Nancy, I can't wait any longer, I hissed into the phone. I want you so much. I just ran a red light and almost died. I think I need help organizing this divorce. It's about time, she said. What do you need to do? I told her my plan and she instantly agreed. I smiled to myself. Another domino fell into place. I left the office around nine in the morning to be there in time to watch the garbage man's fun. Just like the previous times he pulled up to my driveway to help Justine with the trash can. The kind bastard even helped her roll it back to the house where they left it and went inside. I made the call and my people knew it was time. Before Justin and the trash man even closed the door, eight gang members emerged from their parked cars. They walked straight to the garbage truck, nodding at me from my hiding place. As soon as they started the noisy truck, the garbage man ran out of the house. He was naked as he tried to zip up his overalls and run to his truck. I filmed it. He was yelling at the guy in the truck. He then locked the doors and said, No speak English, idiot. Goodbye. He then left in a truck. The scavenger was furious. He tried to follow the truck down the street and soon found himself surrounded by gang members. A few words were said, which was probably a mistake on his part, but he was furious. The ensuing fight was so one-sided that it couldn't even be called a fight. They hit him again and again until he fell. They then trampled and kicked him until he lost consciousness. The whole time they were beating him, they made him understand how stupid it was to get involved with other people's wives. It looks like someone called the police because sirens were heard in the direction of the fight. 
All the guys disappeared into the background long before the first police car arrived. When the car arrived, all they found was the garbage man, barely breathing. I sent a copy of the video disc to the city sanitation department. I knew that it would take at least a couple of days for the disc to reach his immediate superior through the chain of command. This is exactly what I wanted. When he regains consciousness, he'll probably try to make up a story about how he was working when he was attacked. Once his boss gets that CD and sees him running out of my house naked while his truck gets stolen, his career will be over. I licked my finger and made an imaginary mark on my invisible chalkboard. When I got home that night, Justine was a little tense. The funny thing was that she didn't even know what happened to the garbage man until one of our neighbors came and told us about it. What was even funnier was that she didn't even know the name of the man who had been having her every two weeks day for I don't know how long. I hooked at her while we were watching TV on Tuesday night. How long? she asked. Maybe another week, ten days maximum, I replied. I would wait for you forver, she said. You will, bitch, I thought. On Wednesday morning, I woke up to a snake squeezing me. It was just in the snake. She had her arms and legs wrapped around me so tightly that I could not free myself without waking her if I tried. Love you so much, she purred as I headed into the shower. No rain, no snowstorm, no hail, I said. Uh, she said, abruptly opening her eyes. I love you, and next week we will have sex without delay, I said. She smiled and fell asleep again. I left for work convinced that every color in the spectrum had somehow become brighter. Around three o'clock in the afternoon, I called Justine. Our postman usually arrived at about three ten o'clock. I wanted her to know that I was at work. I made my secretary talk to me in the background to confirm in her mind that I was actually at work. And I was. When Bill Pinder, our married mailman, walked down the street, he didn't know he was being filmed. He delivered a letter or two to a nearby house and then pushed his cart towards my house. Although he didn't take any letters with him, he walked to the door where Justine greeted him. They walked inside, closing the door behind them. Exactly six minutes later, he left the house looking disappointed, buttoning his pants as he walked. Before he could reach his cart with several canisters of tear gas, a pit bull dog attacked him, knocking him to the ground. The angry dog beat him brutally for several minutes, breaking several bones and tendons so that he could not walk for several years. His days in the postal service were probably over, just like his marriage. His wife visited him in the hospital. She was very beautiful and loved him very much. I didn't like handing the disc to one of the orderlies and asking him to give it to her. In fact, I almost changed my mind about doing it. But I looked at this woman and saw something of myself in her, the part where she was hopelessly in love with a man who cheated on her over and over again. At least this way she would know the truth. What she chose to do with this information was up to her. The next day I checked the hospital again. I used the name of one of our neighbors when I made the appointment. I thought they would never be able to track down my deception unless Arnold Ziegler actually showed up at the hospital at the same time as me. In any case, the poor postman's wife didn't visit him all day. The medical staff was a little worried because she promised to return in the morning. When they called to find out when she was coming, she told them to tell this cheater that he could contact her through her lawyer and that she had put all his things in his brother's garage. When I woke up Thursday morning, the colors were still a little brighter, but I was nervous. This was the hardest part of my plan because Justine had to be there. This meant that, since I was not yet ready to let her know that I knew about her actions, I could not be present again, just like the previous day when the fact of my being at work while the dog attacked our mailman made me the typical unsuspecting husband if the police were to investigate. Again, a few minutes before the NPS truck arrived, I was on the phone with Justine. When she heard the truck arrive, she let me go. From the video taken by my private investigator, the timing was perfect. Justin and Riley were just getting out to the truck when Nancy pulled up in an NPS vehicle. Riley's wife, Darla, was with her. Nancy used her key to open the truck door and walked in on Riley, just as they were about to have sex. Darla screamed at Riley and burst into the truck, punching him several times. 
She then unleashed her fury on Justine, who tried to escape. Darla attacked Justine's back and hit her four or five times. She then turned her over and delivered a powerful blow to Justine's right eye. Riley tried to lift his pants while Nancy clicked the camera, thinking it would help me with the divorce. You're fired, Riley, she screamed in a voice loud enough to be heard in the next state. But I, he began, go home. Don't even think about going back for your things. We will send them to you, Nancy said sharply. Yeah, Darla said. And don't you dare come home. I want a divorce. I'll take everything you have. You'll never see Megan again, and I'll sue your bitch too. From what the neighbors later told me, Nancy and Darla simply got into the car and drove away after that. Riley sat on my porch, bleeding and crying, for over an hour before Justine came out onto the porch and told him to leave the property. Well, everything went fine, but not perfect. I had to act quickly to save the day. First of all, I couldn't come home and find Justine with a black eye. Besides, my nosy neighbors didn't have to tell me what happened. I should have given Justine a few days to figure out the situation. I called her and told her that I urgently needed to leave the city to save one of our largest accounts. I flew and the company paid for everything I needed. On the bright side, I told her that we could probably resume our marital relationship upon my return. I told her I was very sorry, but it was inevitable. She said she would miss him very much, but she understood. She also said that she would stick to my promise to make love to her as soon as I returned and not a second later. She also made me promise to call her at least three times a day so she could hear my voice and know everything was okay. I told her I'd be back late on to a stay. This time I didn't actually leave town. I have been dealing with some matters that precede a divorcee. I did not close any accounts or withdraw money from them. My savings account has always been accessible only to me. This is because Justine had a shopping problem. If left alone, she would buy everything she sees. So she always had access to a checking account and a couple of credit cards in her name, which I paid for, but nothing else. I changed the direction of depositing my salary and bonuses into the new account I opened. But if Justine had checked our checking account balance, it would have been the same as yesterday. The only difference would be that from that day on, not a penny would come to him. I also spent two days looking for a nice new apartment, which I hoped to move into by Tuesday evening. I ordered furniture and installed cable TV after I paid a deposit to the complex manager. The last thing I needed to do was find a friend. I spent two days in a curvy chat room until I found exactly the guy I was looking for. I arranged to meet him in person and sat at the bar telling him how wonderful Nancy was. I called Nancy and asked her to meet me at a bar I liked, and Brandon was there too. I introduced them to each other and told Nancy that he was my friend. I explained to her that I was on my way to getting a divorce thanks to her. I also told her that my lawyer warned me against starting anything new until the paperwork was signed. She promised to wait for me, but I could tell by the way they looked at each other that she wouldn't. Nancy was really an important part of my plan, and I wanted her to get something out of it so I was glad they got along. I liked Nancy and would probably sleep with her easily, but I didn't see her as the love of my life. On Monday morning, I called Justine as usual to wish her good morning. She said she woke up with dark spots under her eyes and hoped they would disappear when I returned. She seemed to be hoping to explain away the remains of her bruisa this way. Honey, I wouldn't care if you had two bruises and looked like a raccoon, I said. I want you so much that we might not make it to the front door tomorrow night. She was very happy to hear this. She started telling me on the phone about all the things she was going to do to me. Some of them, I must admit, I had never even heard of before. Anyway, I've always gotten along great with my mother-in-law, so when I called her to tell her my plan to surprise Justine with the great news that I'd been offered a sales manager position and wouldn't have to travel anymore, she wanted to be there. I picked her up in the Mustang, and along the way we chatted about how loud the car was and how nice it was when the acceleration pressed you into the soft leather seats. My timing was perfect. It looks like the tragedy that happened to Riley just a few days ago hasn't slowed Justine down. Her mother was shocked when we saw Justine looking around to make sure no one was watching, then slipped into the ice cream truck. 
She didn't see us because we were halfway up the neighbor's driveway behind their huge, unkempt hedges. Why is she coming into this van? asked her mother. Shock was written all over her face. I don't know, but I'm going to find out, I said, pretending to be angry. In fact, I knew for sure that they would do it. To keep the kids from running to the truck, they drove to the L at the end of our block. This, it was a dead end and couldn't be seen from the main street. She stayed in the truck for about 10 minutes, then got out and ran home. That's why she always wore those damn shorts. Perhaps she also wore them because they were easy to put on and take off. But that was just my theory. We pulled up to the truck, and I got out with my mother-in-law right behind me. I pulled open the door and saw Justine having sex with the ice cream man. Before I could say anything, two cars screeched past mine. One was from the FDA, the other from the city licensing department. We have big problems, the FDA man said. Your company will lose its license, the townsman said. And your ass is grass, Hector, said a rough-looking woman with tattoos on every exposed part of her skin except her face. The woman turned out to be his wife, and the only reason he had a green card. As I walked away from the truck, Justine yelled at me to wait. She needed to explain herself. As usual, her next stupid statement was that it wasn't what I was thinking. I turned sharply and looked at her. So you didn't just screw the ice cream man right in front of me, your mom, and all the other people, I asked. Did you have sex with him in close proximity to open containers of food intended for children? Justine, how could you be so stupid? Asked her mother. I just got in my Mustang and drove away. That evening, Justine called me 114 times. I turned off my phone after the first call, but we live in a digital age, so my iPhone's call log shows how many times she called. Unfortunately, since I chose a 32 gigala iPhone, all 114 messages were saved on it. When I came to work the next day, she was waiting for me in the parking lot. Rudy, I love you so much, please let me explain, she asked. She looked like hell. She must have been crying all night. To be honest, I didn't feel that bad. In fact, seeing the person who broke your heart by cheating on you while constantly professing their love for you, while getting upset and hurting, you does wonders for your soul. I called the guard over and told him that this woman was following me. But Rudy, isn't this your wife? The one you always talk about and tell us all how much you love until we get tired of hearing about it, he said. That was yesterday, I snapped. His description clearly made Justine even more aware of how much I loved her. Her head sank even lower, and she began to cry again. We're going to get a divorce, I said, and she can't follow me to work and bother me. Justine fainted and began to moan. Please, no divorce. This will kill me. She didn't really have to worry about it for two reasons that I'll get into later. When I left, the sun seemed to shine a little brighter again. After the first meeting in the parking lot, Justine simply intensified her attempts to talk to me. She bombarded everyone we knew with phone calls until they were all begging me to talk to her for the sake of the years we had spent together. They said so, but in reality, they all just wanted her to leave them the hell alone too. She filled my personal and business email with tons of letters and messages. Her friends even started calling me and begging me to talk to her. Justine was determined to play it safe that good night. I finally agreed to talk to her once if she would leave me alone after that. She looked at me strangely, but agreed. I think she thought that once we talked, we'd be on the road to reconciliation, which is why she took that risk. She asked me to tell her where I was staying, and she would meet me there. She could cook us dinner and everything. I laughed in her face. I take a different route home every night. I stop at different bars for different times each time to make sure neither you nor anyone else knows where I live, I told her. I will come to your house on the night you choose, I told her. Damn it, Rudy. This is our house, not my house. I have no job. My name isn't even on the mortgage, and our children will be able to live in comfort, she said. Not anymore, I joked. Thank you for reminding me. Tomorrow I will submit my resignation and hand over the house to you. But I don't need this house, she cried. I just want you to. You sure have a funny way of showing me this, I snapped. Justine, if I'm so wonderful, why did you cheat on me? Rudy, it wasn't a scam, she said. 
her eyes filled with tears again. Like I said, I told her, I will come to your house any evening you want. Let's see, yesterday was ice cream day. There was a garbage man today. Tomorrow the postman will arrive and on Thursday your packages will be delivered. What day should I come? She started crying again and told me that I just didn't understand it. If I just listened to her, everything would be fine. Who, Justine, will be fine? I asked. How will all this be good for me? Will your explanation somehow ease my pain and erase the memories of you having sex with different men? I guess Justine hadn't thought that far yet. She just looked down. I just wanted to talk about it and get it all over with. What night would you like me to be there? I repeated. Tonight, please, she said in a very quiet voice. I can't take another night away from you. When I got home that evening, I must admit, I was pleased to be there. Justine was waiting for me when I arrived and she was doing her best. She was wearing a light sundress that reached about four inches above her knees. Her legs were tanned as always, and she did her hair and makeup as if we were going to town. I'm so glad you're back, she said, grabbing my hand. I could already smell the pepper steak and my favorite beef rice. We sat down on the couch and as her legs spread and her dress lifted, I noticed she wasn't wearing panties. Easy access, she said when she noticed me looking. Let's get down to business, I said. Start talking. The sooner you say everything, the sooner I'll leave. No, she answered sharply. Fuck this. You said I could explain myself, so I need to do it my way. We'll have to compromise on some things, but this is my meeting. I simply nodded and looked at my watch. Why are you looking at your watch? She asked. I might have a date, I grinned. Her face sank again. Despair was written all over it. But then she just smiled and said, Well, you better cancel it, because you'll be stuck here for a long time. I just rolled my eyes at that. We'll have a nice dinner together, she said. Then we'll go and sit on the sofa in front of the fireplace and we'll have sex. Then we'll talk. I'll explain my point of view as I see it, and you'll answer. Then we'll make love again and go to bed. If you really think that we need it, we can go to counseling. I agree to dinner. I said. This is probably the last time I'll get this meal, so I might as well enjoy it. There will be no sex, not before, during, or after. Hell, most likely never again. I won't sleep here. This isn't my home anymore. Damn, I can't believe I'm sitting on this damn couch where you are. Her eyes widened in shock, and a hand covered her face. How long did you know? She asked. When I came back from Chicago... I caught you getting into the ice cream man, I said. So you really didn't have an injury? You just didn't want to sleep with me, she hissed. Not for nothing. I was going crazy trying to figure out why you didn't want to kiss me anymore, and you haven't told me you love me since then either. She started crying again. I couldn't stand it. I hugged her. I tried to look at this evening as one of those farewell quizzes you take with your guidance counselor before graduation. All your grades are in and you've passed, but you're both just sitting there talking about what's happened to you over the last four years and how each of you saw it. You see yourself as a solid, well-liked, mid-career student. She sees you as a lazy, isolated loser who could be a great student and very popular if only he could get his head out of his ass and put in the effort. Justine put the food on plates and I noticed that instead of sitting across from each other, she sat us next to each other at the corner of the large table. She held my left hand in hers while we both ate with our right hands. It was really damn romantic. We sat there holding hands, not letting go, no matter what, by the light of just one scented candle. For about half an hour while we ate, I tried to forget about the past. I pushed the hair away from her face and looked into those eyes that I had loved for half my life, and suddenly I started crying too. After dinner, we held hands and headed to our couch. I started a fire in the fireplace while she leaned against me from behind, pressing her small breasts against my back. God, how I wanted her at that moment. But I knew that under no circumstances could I do this. It turned out to be a night of lies and confusion. She was completely honest with me, but she was either stupid or confused. I lied continuously. She asked me if I had anything to do with the brutal beating of the garbage man. He also lost his job and was sued by the city for the value of the truck. 
I told her that not only was I not responsible for this, but before she told me about it, I knew nothing about it. She started talking about the postman. I asked her what happened to him. She told me how he was bitten by a fighting dog. I asked her when it happened and reminded her that we were in touch at that time or a little before. Same with the NPS driver whose wife sued her. We were in touch. She even hung up to go and have sex with him. No, that's not my style at all, I told her. The only person I ever did anything to was you and the ice cream man. It was completely nonviolent. He got a slap on the wrist for what he did. You suffered for your role in it. The only person who really lost was me. Ashamed is an understatement, she said. My own mother refuses to talk to me. All our friends act like I'm some kind of horrible bitch, and none of our neighbors even talk to me. Rumors spread too. At that little store where I buy fruits and vegetables, the owner asked me not to go back there. Apparently, a group of local gossips had gathered to tell him that they would not buy any fruits, vegetables, or anything else that I had been in contact with. This town is not that big. As for the slap in the face to the ice cream man, he got fired. He's getting a divorce, which will lead to his deportation. His bosses lost the licenses for all their trucks, so they'll probably go out of business. That was a pretty big blow for nothing. You said the only person who's lost anything is you. I don't see it. You're not even that upset, and you're ready to just move on and forget me. I don't think I'll ever get over you. I can't eat. I can't sleep. And I cry constantly because of you. I open the closet and I see a jacket. And I remember when we bowed it and how you looked in it. And I just cry and cry until there won't be any tears left for me. What exactly have you lost? I lost you, Justin, I said. I lost the most important thing in my life. Since the sixth grade, you are all I ever thought about. The human brain processes millions of thought impulses per second. Half of my thoughts are about you. I lost my wife, my lover, my partner, my best girlfriend, my dream, and the mother of my children, all in an instant. You lost four guys you didn't even care enough to remember their names. I lost six women, and I loved every damn one of them. Who wins in this comparison? Now comes the worst part, Justin. I'm sitting here right now, and I see the children we could have had that will now never be born. So, in essence... You and your lovers killed the children you so wanted to have? Justin, your ass should be jealous of what comes out of your mouth, I finally said. Whether sex ends or not, sex is sex. We both made a vow to be faithful to each other when we got married. You broke that vow probably more times than I can count. Any one of these guys could have gotten you pregnant. What about diseases, Justin? I don't remember you forcing them to use condoms. It's just stupid. The atmosphere and the fire made me think about what you mean to me, but I need to leave now. I stood up from the couch, and she grabbed me around the waist and tried to pull me back. Please, don't divorce me. Give me another chance, she begged. Justin, I'm not going to divorce you, I said. The laws in this country are unfair when it comes to divorce. Men never get a fair treatment, no matter the circumstances. After seeing how much you hurt me... I'm never going to get married again, so I don't need a divorce. I'll just leave. See you. And I left. I was transferred to another office in another city. The first few months were hell for me. I often woke up in the middle of the night screaming Justin's name. I cried for a while and tried to go back to sleep. I have found that the best thing to do is make a cup of tea and try to write down my feelings for Justine. I always wrote hate in big angry letters. Then I wrote love next to it in smaller letters. It took me almost a year to realize that both were true. I loved Justine with all my heart and soul, but I hated what she did to us. My iPhone decided everything for me. I was in the store when my mom called. Rudy, you need to come home, she said. This is Justin. How can you tell when you love someone? People always ask this question. Is it some magical combination of proteins or amino acids that takes over the brain? The devil knows. But I know that when you love someone and someone tells you that they need you, you drop everything and go to them immediately. And that's what I did. I didn't go home to get clothes. I didn't call and say I wouldn't be at work. I didn't even go to the cash register. I just walked away and left my cart in the middle of the store.
to hell with milk. Damn the balls. Justine needed me. She didn't look good at all. She was like a skeleton. She did not take care of herself and never received treatment for her gonorrhea. Apparently, she didn't know that she was still insured by me and that insurance would pay for any necessary treatments. I sat by her bed and watched her sleep. When she finally woke up a few hours later, her eyes immediately focused on me. Hello, honey, she said. Looks like I really ruined everything, doesn't it? She asked. Did they tell you what I have? I nodded. Did they tell you what they wanted to do with me? I nodded again as tears rolled down my cheeks. Thank you for coming to see me, she said. I know you don't want to hear it, but I still love you. I always will. I don't know why I played all these damn games, but through it all, I never stopped loving you. You're a part of me, and you always will be. I guess I should also tell you that there was another guy. He was an electrician. She started crying while saying this. If I could just keep my legs together, you and I would still be together. We'd be happy, and maybe I'd be pregnant right now. I see her too, you know, she said. Justin, I set you up, I said with tears rolling down my cheeks. I did it because of you. I was mad at you for sleeping with those guys, so I arranged to ruin their lives and give you an STD. I thought you'd be even more ashamed when you had to go to the clinic for treatment. I just wanted you to feel a little of the pain I was feeling. It's my fault. She smiled at me then and shook her head. Damn, Rudy. You did all this because of me? You ruined three marriages and hurt or injured two men because of me? You really should have loved me almost as much as I love you. You didn't make me sleep with them. Most women we know wouldn't let a strange man into their homes, much less. None of this is your fault. It's all mine. I was just a stupid girl playing games. I tried to have it all right away. But if it makes you feel better, you really hurt me. None of your revenge plans worried me, Rudy. I was indifferent to all these men. And although I am ashamed to say it, their loss of health, wives, or children in general, I didn't care. But when you left me, Rudy, I almost died. I just didn't want to live. I didn't care about myself because I didn't care. She took my hand and pressed it to her chest. My heart beats only for you, Rudy. I'm not trying to blame you for anything, but you should know what's going on here. If it's so important to you that I live, you should give me something worth having. Live. Otherwise, why should I go through the operation? She didn't need any more words. We both knew what she wanted, and although my mind was completely against it, I followed my heart. So yes, I'm a coward. I returned home to take care of Justine after surgery. I returned to my old job and cared for her until she regained her strength and stabilized the combination of medications needed to fight off multiple infections. She looked like her old self again. She became beautiful again. We spent every free minute together. We both seemed to understand that our time together was uncertain. Nothing was certain. We spent a lot of time lying in each other's arms in front of the fireplace. We talked about everything and nothing. Children were always a big topic of our conversations. Of course, there were things we couldn't talk about or do. Any mention of ice cream drove me crazy. What is her name? She asked one evening. Our daughter you saw, the one who looks like me. What's her name? Julie, I said, crying. Where did this come from? She asked, wiping my tears. This was one of our main rules. No tears, no matter the circumstances. We just had to play with the cards we were dealt. Crying about it won't solve anything. The first part of Justine is Jew, I said. The last part of Rudy is lie. L is for love, I said. And that's all there was ever between us. She nodded, trying not to cry. Some of my neighbors look at me strangely when I walk down the street holding her hand tightly. But I do not care. It's my life, not theirs, so they have no say in what I do or who I'm with. We even had sex, if you can call it that. Doctors were amazed at Justine's recovery. They all apologized to us. They were forced to give Justine a full hysterectomy. Both of her ovaries and fallopian tubes were removed. Untreated gonorrhea damaged everything too much to save anything. Justine had known about this for weeks and refused. She decided that it was better to die than to lose the opportunity to have children. Ultimately, however, it was not gonorrhea 
that took her. After surgery and several courses of very strong antibiotics, she was declared free of the disease. I remember how happy I was when they told us this. Justine smiled a little and squeezed my hand, but I felt like something was still missing. It was Julie who took her from me. Justine simply couldn't come to terms with the fact that the thing she wanted more than anything in the world would now never happen. She still followed my logic from earlier that she killed our children because they never would. So one day while I was at work, less than a year after we got back together, Justine swallowed almost two bottles of very strong sleeping pills and never woke up. She left me a short note. She loved me more than life itself, but she could not live knowing that she had killed our children. I collapsed. It took me months before I even shaved or washed my face, let alone anything else. Then the dreams began. I dreamed that Justin and Julie were waiting for me in heaven. So I tried to join them, but I couldn't. And 15 months ago, I started dating again. I've dated women. Some were good, some were bad. I even had sex with some. But finally, I think I'm truly ready to love again. The woman to whom I told all this smiled at me. We sat on a bench in front of the water surface. Her head was lying on my lap, and she was looking at me with the most wonderful expression on her face. It was a mixture of pleasure and happiness with a little bit of care. Looks like it was love. Jennifer, she said and pulled me to kiss her waiting lips. I smiled and nodded. I think if we're going to get married and live happily ever after, you need to know that, she said. Rudy, I've been waiting for you all my life. My first three husbands all cheated on me. I looked shocked. Oh yes, you liked what you saw from the very beginning, she said. It wasn't like that with them. I know I'm not a supermodel. I'm beautiful, but it's girl next door beauty. And I think you like that. Like Justine, you really need a partner and a best friend to be with. Could have a lot of sex. That's what I want too. I'm not the kind of girl who will withhold my services to get what they want. I will definitely provide sex, but only to one person. My man. I'll stay with you forever, Rudy. I'll grow old with you. And we're really not that old. We're only in our mid-thirties. I'll bear you children. Anything. I'll do. Just promise me one thing. Don't ever cheat on me. How did you survive other husbands? I asked, holding her hand. Remember when you decided to take revenge on Justine and her lovers? She asked. So, it was pretty much the same thing with me. My first husband died from poisonous mushrooms. He had a very bad reaction and anaphylactic shock. He died a terrible and painful death right in front of me. She shook her head as if trying to erase a bad memory. My second husband also died from poisonous mushrooms. It was a really strange coincidence. I have to say, I cook pepper steak too, she said. What about your last husband? I asked. You're not a cheater, she said. You and I will live together forever. Um, I meant the guy before me, I said. Oh, he died of a skull fracture, she said. Wow, I said. How did it happen? I sighed with relief. One more coincidence would have alarmed me a little. She got the weirdest look on her face and said, that bastard didn't want to eat mushrooms. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.